while many patients who are intubated and ventilated in ICU make a rapid return to independent breathing, some patients require prolonged ventilation. Many factors can contribute to a patient's failure to wean from the ventilator. An understanding of these issues is important, as addressing these factors can reduce ventilation times, complications and therefore outcomes for these patients. A convenient checklist of contributing factors is presented here. Essentially, causes fall into seven key groups. Respiratory muscle power, resistance issues, compliance issues, respiratory demand, decreased ventilatory drive, subclinical cardiac dysfunction, and sputum clearance. Reduced respiratory muscle power is a common cause of respiratory insufficiency. Various factors play a part, but weakness is common in very sick patients. Muscle power can be gauged by a number of methods. A global assessment of muscle strength can be gained on examination, such as limb strength, the ability to sit or raise the head from the bed, and grip strength. Specific testing of respiratory muscle power includes negative inspiratory pressures, the measurement of forced vital capacity, spontaneous ventilatory trials and other methods. The maximal negative pressure generated by the patient may be a marker of respiratory strength. Generating a negative inspiratory pressure less than minus 30 centimetres of water has been associated with successful extubation though application in practice has been disappointing. Alternatively, the effort required from the patient to generate flow may be reflected in the negative pressure generated by a very brief occlusion of the circuit at the start of inspiration, known as P0.1. A negative pressure of 2 centimetres of water or less during a 0.1 second inspiratory occlusion is regarded as normal, while patients who have to generate pressures less than negative 4 to 6 centimetres of water are more likely to fail extubation. Forced vital capacity is a global measure of ventilatory capacity. Asking the patient to inspire deeply and exhale completely on minimum respiratory support can give a guide to the patient's respiratory reserve. It is felt that a forced vital capacity greater than 15 mils per kilo is associated with a better chance of extubation success. In some instances, removing the patient from ventilator support and observing their response can give an idea to how successful extubation will be. A variety of methods for this test have been described, including a TP system and using pressure support with minimal settings. Some ventilators have an automated tube compensation setting that can reportedly remove any respiratory support other than that required to overcome the imposed resistance of the endotracheal tube. A measure of the adequacy of spontaneous breathing, known as the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index, has been proposed, but its utility remains the subject of debate. A number of other predictive indices have been proposed, including formula that integrate a number of measures. None have been found to significantly impact on patient care. These tests are a measure of global respiratory insufficiency, not limited to respiratory muscle power. However, successful tests are likely to indicate that power is adequate. The improvement of respiratory muscle power requires a multimodal approach. Factors that can contribute include nutrition, pro-catabolic states such as burns, trauma, pancreatitis and sepsis, drugs such as steroids, sedatives, muscle relaxants and aminoglycoside antibiotics, electrolyte disturbances, hypothyroidism, ICU neuromyopathy and general deconditioning, and fatigue and sleep deprivation. Addressing each of these issues, along with regular respiratory exercise and physiotherapy, 
can help to improve respiratory power. Preventing fatigue is essential, as recovery of diaphragmatic strength can take days in some patients, further delaying the weaning process. An approach to progressively exercising the patient with weaning failure will be covered in a separate vodcast. Resistance is a major contributor to the work of breathing. Resistance can be imparted by any component of the respiratory system, from the ventilator circuit right down to the alveolus. Occasionally, ventilators and ventilator settings can contribute to the resistance of gas flow. Where necessary, seek expert advice. The size of the endotracheal or tracheostomy tube is an important contributor to resistance. Importantly, according to Persuil's law, a small change in diameter of the tube has a major impact on airway resistance. Length of the tube also plays a part, so in theory, a tracheostomy tube may improve respiratory function significantly. Changing tubes to a more appropriate size may facilitate weaning in some cases. Bronchospasm and air trapping are common in ICU patients. Bronchodilators, steroids and appropriate ventilator settings may be required. In some patients with airflow limitations such as asthma and emphysema, intrinsic PEEP development increases the work of breathing required to adequately inspire. Application of a small amount of extrinsic PEEP and implementation of strategies to reduce intrinsic PEEP development such as increasing inspiratory flow rate and reducing tidal volumes and respiratory rate are important. For more information on this, see our vodcast on patient ventilator dyssynchrony. Sputum production and caking of the airways with secretions may also contribute to resistance. The use of mucolytics remains controversial, but chest physiotherapy and careful airway toileting is essential. A multitude of conditions can contribute to impaired lung compliance. In broad terms, these can be considered pulmonary and non-pulmonary in nature. Pulmonary causes can include edema, either cardiac in origin or related to lung inflammation, a pneumothorax, a large pleural effusion, atelectasis or lung consolidation. Extrapulmonary causes include obesity and increased abdominal pressures. Appropriate steps to address these issues is important, including optimisation of body position, drainage of ileus and effusions, and diuretic therapy. In some patients, a contributing factor to weaning failure is the increase in demand being placed on their respiratory system. A common cause of this is fever. Carbon dioxide production is related to basal metabolic rate, which in turn is increased in fever. Additionally, a pro-catabolic state, such as seen in sepsis, may enhance CO2 production. Another cause of elevated carbon dioxide production is overfeeding, particularly with high carbohydrate feeds. The impact of this, however, has not been confirmed in clinical trials. Another contributor is metabolic acidosis. The normal physiological response to this condition is hyperventilation and the increased demand imposed by this can tip patients into respiratory failure. For some patients, the drive to breathe spontaneously and effectively is reduced. This may include structural and functional central nervous system impairments such as stroke, hypoxic brain injury, metabolic alkalosis, and sedative medications. In some patients, pre-existing disorders like the obesity hypoventilation syndrome may contribute. Delirium, anxiety, and agitation may also lead to impaired respiratory function and non-compliance with other interventions. Controlling these factors may also improve the process. Positive pressure ventilation has well-known benefits on cardiac function and this is reflected in the beneficial effects of non-invasive ventilation in patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. 
Non-invasive ventilation can improve oxygen delivery to the myocardium, improve cardiac performance, and may have a positive effect on clearing lung water. It can also reduce shunt and reduce oxygen consumption by the respiratory muscles. In addition, positive pressure reduces preload by reducing venous return. It also reduces afterload by increasing the pressure gradient down which blood will flow to the body. Both of these effects have a positive effect on cardiac function. Liberating patients, therefore, from positive pressure ventilation may unmask borderline left ventricular dysfunction as these beneficial effects are removed. Silent ischemia is another potential cardiac cause of failure to wane. Increasing cardiac work and reduced oxygen delivery associated with weaning may contribute to cardiac failure. Assessment of cardiac function, including objective measures such as echocardiography, troponin and bead natriuretic peptides, may facilitate introduction of measures that can offset these effects such as diuresis, fluid restriction, ACE inhibitors, antihypertensive medications and other vasodilators. The inability to cough and clear sputum from the respiratory tree may significantly compromise ventilation. Frequent suctioning may help, but is often imperfect, and mucolytics are of uncertain benefit. Mrs Kafups is a 72-year-old 64kg lady who presented with abdominal sepsis secondary to a perforated sequel tumour. Following a right hemicolectomy, abdominal washout and stoma creation, she remains intubated 10 days later. She is ventilated on a size 8 tracheostomy tube. Her ventilator settings include the pressure support of 16 centimetres of water, peep of 8 centimetres of water and a fraction of inspired oxygen of 0.4. Her respiratory rate is 24, while a blood gas demonstrates a pH of 7.34, a PaO2 of 74 millimetres of mercury and a PaCO2 of 45 millimetres of mercury. Her x-ray is shown here. Clinical examination reveals dullness of both lung bases, a laterally displaced apex beat and a soft pan-systolic murmur at the apex. She has a strong cough and is making small quantities of mucoid sputum. Her heart rate is 90 in sinus rhythm and her blood pressure is 110 on 75 millimetres of mercury. She is globally weak barely able to lift her arms and legs off the bed. Her abdomen is distended but not tender. She is enterally fed at approximately half of her goal rate due to high aspirates. She has not passed a bowel motion since day three of her admission. Biochemistry testing suggests normal renal and liver function and her electrolytes are within normal ranges. Her serum albumin is 26, rising from a low of 19 during her illness. What factors may be impairing her progress and what can we do to facilitate it? It is likely that her slow progress is multifactorial. Muscle power appears important and attention to improving her nutritional intake by introducing prokinetics or nasojejunal feeding along with frequent physiotherapy and intervals of unassisted breathing to improve her respiratory muscle power are important. A size 8 tracheostomy tube is more than adequate to allow successful ventilation weaning for this patient. Respiratory resistance does not appear to be contributory. The chest x-ray suggests bilateral pleural effusions that would be significant enough in size to compromise her respiratory compliance. This would be further impaired by abdominal distension, so a bowel management regime and gastric venting should also be implemented. Insertion of a fine bore chest drain to relieve the effusions should be considered strongly, though the benefits must be weighed up against the potential risks of an invasive procedure. Finally, as clinical examination suggests a degree of cardiac dysfunction, an echocardiogram should be arranged, diuretics introduced as hemodynamic stability allows, and consideration given to introducing an ACE inhibitor. 
Failure to progress with weaning from the ventilator is a potentially serious problem as it leads to prolonged ventilator times and exposure to risks that accompany it. Reducing power, increasing resistance, decreasing compliance, increased demand, reduced respiratory drive, cardiac dysfunction and impaired sputum clearance all contribute. A stepwise approach to analysing the underlying factors that contribute to weaning failure is appropriate. Remember, the best approach to this problem is rarely to do nothing.